Welcome to Below the Line, where we talk about working in Hollywood from the crew perspective. My name is Skid. I'm a former assistant director and your host. Today, we're talking about Griselda, the six-episode miniseries starring Sofia Vergara as Colombian drug lord Griselda Blanco, currently streaming on Netflix. And I'm happy to welcome back to the show Angela Nagaro, makeup department head. Angela, it's nice to see you. Nice to see you too, Skid. Glad to be talking about this. First, a warning for listeners. Today's conversation will contain spoilers. Let's dive right in. Angela, to me, one of the challenges of this show right out the gate is that Sofia Vergara in the title role, she's iconically known for her role on Modern Family, the comedy. And she's currently a judge on America's Got Talent. For her to move into this dramatic role, I can only imagine that the decisions being made around everything around her character, but specifically the makeup, is going to be really important and, and require some work before filming even starts. So, as you know, because we've spoken about this on our Academy Award uh, podcast that we've done. So, as we discussed on the Academy podcast, realistic transformations through the use of prosthetics are completely possible but not on a television schedule. And in order to have made Sophia truly look like Griselda Blanco, with her being in every scene of the show, would have been physically impossible. So from that point forward, we opted just to change her look so she wasn't as iconically recognizable as she is. And to give her an edge, because Sophia is beautiful. Griselda had a certain beauty to her, even though she wasn't considered your classic beauty. But she definitely had an edge to her that gave her a little some je ne sais quoi. <laughs> <laughs> that made her just, in order to convey the brutal, Do you know what I mean? Like she needed to be brutal. So that's where we started. Now, let me ask you about, so Griselda Blanco, I'm not that familiar with how she looked. Her Wikipedia page has her mug shot up. And obviously that's not the ideal circumstances for anybody to be photographed. That being said, you must have done more research on her as an actual person had access to more materials than maybe I would on a quick search. Yes. I mean, And like I said, in her youth, the mugshot is the iconic photo. Um, But in in that shot, she's also much older. She's already been in prison for a long time because she was in and out of prison a few times. So depending on the mugshot you saw. Um, But in her youth, which is the majority of where our story takes place anyway, I mean, she was married several times. She had a beauty about her, an, an appealing something about her. That attracted men. I mean, you know, you don't get married three times if men are not attracted to you. So, like I said, so that was our starting point of trying to figure out her transformation. We originally started with getting rid of her iconic eyebrows because we knew that that would change her face completely. Um, Originally, because this project had been in the works for a long time. Oh, I see. Yeah. Originally, the producers had brought in Billy Corso to design a look. So Billy had done a makeup test pre-COVID where they put um, Sophia into period makeup and got rid of her eyebrows. Um, And then COVID happened and everything went on hold for a year. (laughs) You know, it changed the world. So, um, So then when we came back out and now I was brought on to the project, we started again going through the makeup tests. They didn't love where they had left off. Nothing to do with Billy, of course, because Billy is a genius makeup artist. But um, they hadn't yet found what they were looking for. The director wanted to see something just a bit grittier. He wanted her to be gritty. And that, in her, without makeup, she does not have it all. She is not gritty at all. Particularly, then you're going to be reminded of her other characters without makeup. Yes. Oh, just as a, yes. It's not, uh, you're going to wonder what this character is doing in this scenario. Completely. Um, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to say that she was 100% on board. 
I will say that I think that it was a scary place for her to go because it is not in her wheelhouse. It wasn't in her comfort zone. You know, she's never done a dramatic role before. Um, she's always been the beautiful girl. So now not necessarily being the beautiful girl. I, I think there were concerns. I'll, I'll put it nicely and say that there were concerns. Um, I really fought for her to have a prosthetic nose because in my world, just doing the eyebrows didn't make the transformation that I felt she, we needed to see. And it's literally a matter of lines. You know, when you look at somebody's face, the lines of their face determine, you know, where your eyes go and what you perceive. And she has this lovely little upturned nose in real life. And my feeling was that in the world of character and I don't know, a little bit of evil, a, a downturned nose <laughs> always worked better. <laughs> so, so that's when we brought on the idea of playing with the shape of her nose, which in my opinion, still to this day, is truly what really changed her look. No, I would agree. It not only changes her look as far as what you're seeing, but presumably changes it for the other actors as well. And then uh, just allows her to better occupy the space of this character. Again, not having been on set or knowing what kind of challenges you faced, I'm presuming she came around to the work that it takes to do that look every day. And again, cause she is in, you know, almost every scene. Yeah. I'm, you know, I mean, when you commit to doing a role, you have to commit. So, <laughs> <laughs> so in that, in that, after we had decided about all of this and we realized the amount of time that it was going to take and the amount of costume changes and wardrobe changes and scene changes that we had, we thought it best to bring in somebody strictly dedicated to her. And so I brought in Todd McIntosh and he took over as her makeup artist and then carried out all of her transitions and all of the stuff that she had to do. We'll put that in some context for me. So you said that they had done a lot of the pre-production work before COVID. Well, they did. No, they did one makeup test. Got it. Okay. So, yes. so they, so there were plans for it. COVID came around, derailed those plans. Correct. What sort of schedule did you end up with? Where did you do the filming? Again, give me some context for how, what it took to get the show done. Okay, so, okay, so apparently this had been in the work for 10 years. I jumped on board in the summer of 22. Okay. No, is that right? No, that's wrong. COVID was 20, right? Started COVID was 20, all of right. 20. Okay. I came on board in the middle of 21. Okay. Uh, in the summer of 21. And so that's when we started doing all of the tests, all of everything, start talking about ideas and designs and characters and everything. We were set to start shooting in November of 21. And Netflix decided that they wanted a bit more action put into the scripts. So even though we had all of the scripts that had been written, we decided to push another three months until the beginning of the new year and give the writers time to go back in and make the considerations that Netflix wanted. Got it. So we ultimately didn't start shooting until the January of 22. But in January 2022, you're still filming under COVID conditions, right? It's still yes. masks and the whole de deal on set. Yes. Um, things had lightened up a little bit because in 20 in 21, when I was working, and in 20 when I was working, um, you know, if you came within five feet of somebody that had been diagnosed, you were swept off set. <laughs> like the SWAT, the SWAT team came in. 
<laughs> yeah, that was my job for a while. I sweeping people off a set. I remember. <laughs> so, but, so it wasn't um, quite that strict with the time twenty two rolls. No, we off. right. We had loosened up quite a bit, so it was a little bit better. Um, I mean, granted, we still had the problems of people still getting COVID and still people still going down with COVID and. You know, and the schedule changing. I don't remember. It feels like it was forever ago. I don't really remember. I don't think that our show, oh, our show went down. But only because of, since we pushed, Sophia had to go back to America's Got Talent. She was contracted for that. So we shot the beginning of 22 for three months, took a break, and then shot after a month, we took a month off and then we went back and we finished the next three months. Got it. Which was another. And where was the filming done? So we're set in Miami in the seventies and eighties. Are, are you filming down South or where, where are you guys located for this? We were filming in Long Beach and Pomona. Okay. <laughs> and Hollywood magic. We made it look, <laughs> we made it look like Miami. <laughs> Now go from there. Tell, talk to me to what degree the period aspects are also a consideration for makeup, not just for Sophia and the Griselda character, but for the rest of the cast. Oh, everybody. Um, you know, it was period. We had a couple of different things that were going on because it was period. It was cultural. Because this also took place all in the same time as the boat people. And everybody, all of the Cubans coming over, the Cuban boat thing that happened in the 70s. It's a big part of the story, right? It's a big part of the story. And they had their own cultural look. And because they had been in, you know, communism for so long and locked up, like, we didn't know what the look of any of that was until everybody started coming over. So facial hair and... um you know, not so much with the women because the majority of the Cubans that came over were all men. The majority were men and families, but we didn't, that didn't really play a role in our story. Um, and then we had the Colombian aspect, which during those days in Colombia, the women were done up to the nines. I mean, listen, it was a makeup period to begin with. It was disco and it was dancing and it was nightclubs. And so it was makeup heavy to begin with. Um, which is always very fun. You know what I mean? And that whole look, you know, I mean, I lived through the 70s. So when you remember <laughs> them, you, <laughs> you remember what was going on. But you also talked about the challenge of schedule on a TV budget. I mean, this sort of attention to detail, it's going to make the hair and makeup budget overall larger than it would for a for a normal miniseries. It, you, you said you brought in Todd McIntosh to cover her specifically but then with this much going on resources can make a big difference did you have the resources that yes, this was just no, normal stressful or was it crazy stressful no it was normal stressful netflix gave us everything that we needed and yeah i mean we had everything that we needed at our just at our disposal there was no they wanted it to look good so they gave us whatever we want we asked for you know and, and and being a department head for, you know, 30 some odd years, I mean, I am resourceful in the fact that I know how to not spend useless money, wasteless, right. wasteful <laughs> money. You know what I mean? Like, I you know, know exactly what you mean. And so what other challenges were there besides the uh, Griselda look? Maybe that maybe people wouldn't notice because that look is that look works, but it also demands attention. And I'm curious what in watching again, I might not have noticed, but was a challenge for you? Well, we had a lot of facial hair pieces going on. How about this? We had two really big challenges that actually never occur in the world of filmmaking that occurred on this. One was since we went down for a month in between shooting, I lost my entire department oh. besides Todd. Because they found other work in the meantime. Of that's because they also had plans to, and they're not waiting around. They're not they're so, not going over to America's Got Talent to shoot while while you're waiting, right? Correct. And on the heels of COVID, everybody needed to work. And you know. So in the middle of the show, I found myself having lost my entire department. So I had to now bring in a new key and an, an entire new department and get everybody up to speed 
with a cast of 86 wow. <laughs> when we came back. Then, just to add insult to injury, my trailer and the hand trailer were robbed. Oh, my God. During the time that we were down. So, principal wigs were stolen. Um so many things. The list was very long of all of the things that had been stolen out of both of our trailers. So now we come back in, we're getting ready to gear back up and shoot. And all of a sudden we're opening drawers and going, wait, what happened to, oh my God, this is where is, where? <laughs> it was a bit insane. It was I, a I, bit insane. I, I can't even imagine quite frankly, how you recover off the, without creating a further delay. I mean, just to, to, to get back up to speed like that, it's an incredible undertaking. Thank God that Sophia, because Sophia's hairdresser, Sophia had her own hair and makeup. People. Um, thank God for Kelly Klein, who is an amazing hairdresser. Um, Kelly had taken all of Sophia's wigs home. Whew. So, and he was doing work on them. So we didn't have to worry about her stuff. Thank God. Everybody else, all of the other women weren't necessarily slated to shoot immediately up after the break. So, but it put everybody into high gear, getting right. new wigs, getting everything cut, getting everything we stuck. All of the things that we had taken all of our prep time to do months ago, Dennis now had to double time to get everything together for all of that. Right. So, um, and then the other thing, and this was a fun thing that we did. So, you know, back in the 70s, the tattoo situation was nowhere near as rampant as it is now. So there were a tremendous amount of tattoos that needed to be covered on all of our background. <laughs> Try to take it, you have to take it back in time. Right. So, and then part of the other thing is, is that because we had such a specific group of people, again, back to the culture, we had, at my team, we decided we were going to have fun with this. So we actually designed on our iPads with our eye pencils all of our own tattoos. And we actually made in-house all of the tattoos that you see on the show, which was really fun because there, you know, there's, it's a complex process to actually make transfers and not hand-drawn because they had to be duplicated numerous times over. But we actually made all of our tattoos. We set up my trailer at one point. It looked like a tattoo factory. <laughs> and we were <laughs> spraying and getting everything because the, the Marilitos had very specific uh, Santeria and religious iconic tattoos that were going on. So, I mean, you know, and then we had aging and <laughs> then we had de-aging. I mean, we really, on this show, we ran the gamut of every makeup trick imaginable. Now, and as we've discussed before, all of that work goes in, but again, the story, it has to be invisible to the viewer in some ways. Otherwise, those kind of, th those kind of issues can end up being distractions. But I got to say, when I watched this, I, I really, I knew that the work that had gone into it and that we had planned to talk about it. So I paid a little more attention, but it doesn't distract, in my opinion, from this story that's unfolding. And that's quite a impressive amount of work, Angela, as far as pulling that all together. Thank you. I have to tell you something, honestly. I watched the story and having seen it, I, I you know, I've gotten through the first two episodes. I haven't watched the whole thing yet. Um, I don't think personally that she could have pulled that off without what we did to her. I actually do not think that she would have been believable at all without what we did to her. Um, she's getting rave reviews everywhere for her look and for, you may have to edit this, what they consider her to be, you know, the, the, cojones, the balls that she had to, to actually step into it. <laughs> oh, got to edit that. I think that's exactly right. Yeah, it's a it's a big under it's a big swing for her. Uh, I, I think she takes a, a, a good crack at it. And uh, yeah, couldn't have done it without without the team. And again, it's not just the makeup, but the attention to period and, and all of this sort of comes together to create an atmosphere where she can inhabit the role that it, yeah, it would have, it would have fallen apart if a lot of these departments, uh, I'm sure you'll testify to the other work as well, but if a lot of these departments hadn't made it real. There wouldn't have been a place for, for, for to act. No, I agree. Um, so one of the compliments that I received that I really, really struck 
deep was that we had created a believable world. Because so often you can see amazing makeup or period makeup in a show that doesn't necessarily look period or period clothes, but you don't really have the feel that this was done in the 50s or 60s or whatever have you. The idea that we created a world that really felt like the 70s and 80s and it was gritty and you really felt like it was in that time period, to me, I took as a major accomplishment for all of us. Any other stories from the set or any uh, specific challenges over the course of this film you want to share with us? Uh, no, I mean, this, the, the sheer amount of people that we had every day were, was our challenges. <laughs> you know, again, covering tattoos because it was a body bearing, you know, period in, in clothing and, you know. Yeah, as far as going back to that time, I, I just, yeah, again, I can't yes. imagine because it's not just your 86 cast members, but all of your background. And there are large groups of people in a lot of these scenes and all that have to fit this attention to detail um, that, uh, yeah, it's just about to, it's a huge amount of work. Yeah, I mean, I it was the, it was probably the first time in my career that I had a show that I literally had 15 makeup artists working. You know, I, I, I've done big shows, but big shows that have been contemporary, so you don't have to worry as much as you do with getting everybody into a period look. Well, folks, I'd encourage you to check it out. Uh, on that note, Angela, we'll call it a wrap. Great having you here. Thank you, Skid, so much. So nice to talk to you again. Thank you. Listeners, I always appreciate your feedback. You'll find my contact info on our website, below the line, one word, dot biz. That's B-I-Z. You'll also find past episodes and links to all of our social media, so check it out. Folks can check out Griselda on Netflix now. Angela, where else can they see your work, or what are you working on that we should watch for? Um, I can't tell you. <laughs> That's what that NDA is about. <laughs> but hopefully, hopefully soon enough, I will be able to reveal my new secret. All right. Well, you've got, sorry, you've got a secret <laughs> project. Obviously, we're not going to press you on that. We understand completely. Hope when that comes together. My closing credits, thanks to Curtis Five for our music, John Juan for our logo, and to all our listeners, I appreciate you. Please rate us wherever you get your podcasts and tell your friends. Thanks again from Below the Line.